the food is just a coping mechanism for what's behind the food. It's, it's actually the behavior. And the goal of that behavior is to fulfill a void. And so when we're looking at emotional eating or mindless eating, I also want to insert that generally 99.9% .9 of the time, there is a layer that is placed on there around dieting. Are you ready to bring your dream body and health into life, but just can't seem to keep the motivation going? And is it finally time to address the self-sabotage and the unwanted eating behaviors such as binge eating, emotional eating, and nighttime eating that you know are getting in the way of your goals? Do you ever wonder what it would take for you to feel in control of your rituals so that you can stay consistent and see results? Welcome to this week's special Make Peace With Food mini-sode on the Fall In Love With Fitness podcast, where you'll learn how to overcome unwanted eating behavior and other self-sabotaging habits by shifting your nervous system so that your body works with you instead of against you. I'm your host, Sherry Shaban, and with each episode, I am honored to be your coach and guide in the journey to make peace with food and find food and body freedom so that struggle with weight is a thing of the past. When you tune in every Thursday on the Fall in Love with Fitness podcast, you'll catch the latest conversation on unwanted eating behaviors and learn how to shift the nervous system, rewire the brain to new patterns, and end the food and body obsession so you finally feel relaxed and no longer confused around food. Now before we begin, I want to quickly invite you to grab a free copy of my Food Freedom ebook that I have for you at makepeacewithfood.com. And if you find that this conversation resonates with you today, then I also want to invite you to join our free Make Peace With Food Facebook community at myfoodfreedomlifestyle.com where you can connect with me and my team directly. The links are in the show notes. And of course, if you know somebody who you feel could benefit from these conversations and discussions, make sure to share this podcast with them too. All right, athletes, now let's get into it. Sherry Shaban, thank you so much for joining us on the Plant Trainers Podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. You're welcome. We're excited for our conversation. And before we get into that, we wanted to know if you have a moment of gratitude to share with us and the listeners. Oh, absolutely. And I, I actually like to keep it so simple. And I'm so grateful for the eyes that see today. I'm grateful for the ears that get to hear. I'm grateful for my heart that gets to beat. I'm grateful for the legs that get to guide me through life every single day. And this is how I usually start my day, just the simplicity of what is available now because it's the things that oftentimes that are taken away from us that we suddenly realize how grateful we are to actually have them. So gratitude, gratitude with gratitude. I absolutely love that. I always say um, gratitude before my feet touch the ground mm. in the morning, yeah. right? So important to think about what you do have and it's not what kind of car you drive or what your last vacation was. It's the simple, simple, simple things. Good. Thank you for sharing that. Good reminder for everyone. So tell us a little bit about your journey to finding plant-based and, you know, what impact that may have had on your life. So full disclosure, the first time I attempted to go plant-based, I was much younger. I wasn't super intentional with what I ate. And the idea was really to just avoid any animal product. And that was in my early 20s. And you know, I had a very different lifestyle back then. And so I could say that I neglected my nutrition. And I think anybody either way in the early 20s, the way that we live our lives, and we're just maybe not as intentional around what we eat, that could result in deficiencies of sort. But I really would say that my transition happened in 2019. This was around the time where my mom was ill. It was actually her last months. And she just rejected meat. She just couldn't digest meat. And so it had just been steadily going on. She was terminally ill and realized that every time she would eat meat, she'd get very, very ill and she would vomit. And so the rest of my family was trying to encourage her to eat. And so what I did instead is decide to just eat alongside with her, whatever she felt she was able to digest. And so that was really no meat products. We removed butter, we removed cheese and dairy and, and either way, it was kind of progressively moving towards that way. And so initially I was really focused on supporting her 
But then of course the question that comes up was, well, am I gonna have enough protein? Because at that time I ran a gym and as you know, it's all about lifting and protein. And so I actually started deep diving and I am anti-diet, but what I actually did for the first time is pull out my fitness app and then start to monitor my macros because I was just curious, well, what would happen if without intention, I didn't focus on really moving towards protein-based foods, but I just ate. I just ate freely and I put a lot of color on my plate. And what ended up happening was actually me hitting between 20 to 30 grams of protein every single meal without trying. And this meals included hemp seeds and broccoli and Brussels sprouts and, and spinach and all kinds of different colors. And so um, that was really the realization of, wait a minute, my lifting at the gym hasn't changed. I'm hitting all the macros. I'm so fulfilled and satisfied with my food. I'm feeling amazing. I'm sleeping amazing. And so that just kind of became the lifestyle and I haven't turned back since. It's amazing how people think that, oh, you're eating plants, but you can't get your protein. And without even trying, you you really can get more than enough. I mean, unless you're becoming an, a big bodybuilder and you're doing certain things, you'll need even extra. But basically on a plant-based lifestyle, you can hit every single number that you really want to or need to, depending on what your goals are. Right. Yeah, Adam, you said the word like without even trying, right? It was really like, okay, what does my body want? Like, what do, what do I actually crave? And as I just chose what my body was asking for, and then just with curiosity, checking in to see if that was what, let's say, was the right macros to have gym wise, it always, always fell within the category. So that was actually the shocking thing that I wasn't intentionally trying to really focus on beans and more, you know, protein, let's say rich sources. It was just really color and whatever my body felt like having, and it always hit the protein amounts. It's interesting because in the last 24 hours, I've had two converse the, the two conversations that I've had about nutrition, the theme, one of the themes was, I think I might need more protein. And it's, well, what what's giving you that that in like do are you not feeling well? Like what what what's even making you think that in the first place? And it's a piece of literature that they're reading exactly. that's making them think that in the first place. And it's well, what what's on your plate, right? Like what's already on your plate how do you know you're not getting enough already like without without that information and the whole idea of eating what feels right to you and obviously if, if you're emotional eating uh, the sour patch kids might feel right to you but that's still not right for you but right. eating eating what feels right for you but this whole idea that western civilization has given especially to young women but men as well this idea of dieting and the idea of restricting the yes amounts that you have on your plate and when you add that with plant-based you will often get a negative response because you are not eating enough and so many times I one of the first things I used to say to my clients is oh you're not eating enough you need to eat more and they'd be like what I eat so much and I'm like this is not a salad this yeah. this is this is goes inside of wrap this goes inside a sandwich this is this is not the size that your salad's supposed to be but what we think about portions so the idea of intuitive eating and dieting is is really polar opposites would right. you agree yeah absolutely and all these shoulds should should and especially with protein i mean when was the last time we actually heard somebody having a protein deficiency let's say in the western world and yet protein is such an important topic and it's always what's pushed and so to your point shoshana there are these studies and they say we should be getting this much and we should and should and should but why hasn't that changed over time why have we written about this 30 40 50 years ago when you know it was all about bodybuilding and arnold and you know mr universe and all that and now we're still focusing on that information even though science has advanced nutrition has advanced knowledge has advanced and so again, it has to has to bring up that question. Well, when was the last time we actually heard that there was a deficiency? And if we actually look at all diseases in our society, including cancer, where does that stem from? Well, we could look at nutrition and look at how we're no longer actually eating real food. We're eating we're eating food like substances. And in addition to that, the amount of stress 
and the amount of EMF that we're receiving. So all of this actually constitutes our diet and it's not exactly what we're studying, what we're learning about. And instead we're put in this small box where we should be eating this way and we shouldn't be having these certain numbers of calories and the amount of restriction actually creates more psychological relationships with food that that ends up being harmful and impactful. Yeah. It, that that's what we were talking about this morning too about you know eating disorders and where some of that comes from sometimes and when we are restricting so much we just we need to control we need to control something and 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 a lot of people end up either restricting or binging even more than they should right I mean, the the protein thing is such a marketing tool and and it, it just gets me every time you go to a restaurant and they say well what protein would you like with that because protein all of a sudden became an ingredient. I'd like broccoli. Of a Can I have broccoli as my protein? <laughs> right. Like it just drives me nuts. But before when you were speaking, you mentioned the word anti-diet. And I just wanted to get a better feel for what you meant by that. Yeah. So when I started my fitness career, this was in my early 20s. And of course, it was about training and then it was about dieting. And there was the right way to eat, especially if it was to support your type of training. And so when I first got into the space, it was all about the low fat diet. And so we followed the low fat diet and then it was about calorie counting. And so then we followed calorie counting. And then this guy named Atkins said, hey, we're not supposed to be eating carbs and this is what we're supposed to be. So then we followed that. Then I got into the CrossFit world and then that became paleo and then it became keto and then it became macros. And so you'd imagine that it just becomes so incredibly confusing to people because these are all rules. These are major rules. They're very polarizing. And on top of that, there is scientific backup to prove that these rules are correct. So if you're following the keto diet, there's science there. If you're following the vegan diet, there's science there. And so this, this creates a lot of confusion for people. And so really anti-diet just means, like I was talking about earlier, is that intuitive calling. Your body has this intuitive capacity to ask for what it needs. So when I had transitioned to plant-based, as I was sharing earlier, without trying, what does my body want? And when you realize that without rules, your body actually has this calling to what it needs, you actually are more connected to what your needs are. And we can see this when we, let's say our parents or we see young babies coming into the world, they cry when they're hungry. And then when they've had enough to eat, you could not put one more drop of milk in their mouth. Like that is it, it's done. And so we have actually that same ability to ask for food when we're hungry and not just to ask for food, because if we were really to listen to what our body's calling for, it's not calling for, like Shoshana said, it's not calling for the gummy bears. It's not calling for the processed foods. It's actually calling for foods that it recognizes, which is plant based food, which is complete nutrients for the body, because nothing comes in a more perfect package than really what comes in from nature in terms of minerals and nutrients and, and colors and all of the fiber and everything that the body actually needs to assimilate cells and to create digestion. And so anti-diet is really not about pushing processed food and allowing ourselves to eat whatever we want without actually honoring our body. It is the inverse. It's actually allowing the body to call for what it wants when it's hungry and to stop eating when it's full and to allow for a lot of diversity because the more we are diversified in what we're eating, we are impacting gut health. We are actually allowing for a wider spectrum of nutrients to enter the body and then completing all the requirements that the body actually needs to sustain itself, to metabolize, to create hormones and to balance as well all the enzymes. So there is a lot there and, and people might need to le listen back to that because there's a lot, a lot, a lot of good, good points in there. When Adam first went plant-based, Sherry, he used to say, I don't understand. I used to crave chips or chocolate and now I crave bananas and avocados. So that craving changes. The, the more you listen to it and the more that you give your body what you need, the more you can actually crave real foods as opposed to those processed foods. Exactly. And that is intuitive eating. Right. So that that is what we also call intuitive eating is your body's exactly asking for what it needs. If I need a, a banana and I'm craving a banana, am I missing potassium? Am I, am I missing carbohydrates? And so it's just this beautiful opening and sense of curiosity to really be able to fulfill the body's needs in a very different way. So how do you see how does someone pay close enough attention to not crave the gummy bears or the bag of chips and actually crave real food? What What's the disconnect there? So first step is the rules, 
right? So before we start intuitively eating, what we actually need to do is address the food rules that we have. And when we address the food rules, what we're also doing is addressing the emotions that come with those rules. And so diet culture, and likely from a very young age, we've been restricting certain foods. And when we eat these foods, we oftentimes have feelings of shame or guilt or disappointment when we eat them. And so step number one is to really remove the, the rules and to have all food available, even the foods that we're going to coin non-real foods, even if it's processed. Right now, my goal is I need to get rid of the rules. And that would be step one. And in this step, that's where a lot of people start to maybe give up or start to fear what could happen because you may find yourself actually moving towards all those foods that you've been restricting for so long. So let's say you've been staying away from refined sugar for so many years, noticing that every time you have sugar, it's generally a cheat meal or it's something that you find yourself binging on. And so the first step again would be no more rules. All food is okay. All food is emotionally and morally neutral. That means I'm not good for eating this and I'm not bad for eating that. And so it's kind of like removing that reward system in the brain. And like you were saying earlier, the reason why we're binging or the reason why we're craving these sugars or certain foods is really because of the restriction that we had placed on them. We had said, we're not gonna eat these certain foods anymore because they're bad, or we're going to cut calories or be in a calorie deficit because eating this many calories is bad. And so by removing all these rules, we allow ourselves to just neutralize them. And that would be the first step. Then after that, we would slowly start to allow the body to call for certain foods because if in step one, after I've stopped restricting, I find myself having five donuts for breakfast on Monday, and then on Tuesday, I'm going for another three donuts. By Wednesday, my body doesn't want donuts. So that's again, that's the part where a lot of us give up on because we don't allow the body to just get it out of its system and reverse that reward system that we have set up in the brain, that do dopamine reward system. And so the foods just start, starts to lose power over us and we actually start to gain the power. And now we can start making those decisions. And now it's not based on needing to lose weight. It's not based on me being flawed because I don't like the way that I look. It's actually based on what my body is needing. And so we slowly start to transition to this place where we're listening now to the signals in the body and we are fulfilling those signals. And now this is a process that does take patience. But what I do want to say here is that if you're following people talking about intuitive eating, I would just say be super mindful with who you follow because there's just so much of this conversation now that we're finding on social media and a lot which promote eating processed foods or eating foods that don't serve us as a form of intuitive eating. And that's not what it's about. Intuitive eating is really asking and listening to the body's signals. And then if you did want that piece of cake, have that piece of cake. And that's it, it ends there. It's not a good or bad person. It's not that I messed up or it's my cheat day or I screwed up my meal plan. It's really because I felt like having that that day and then it stops there. Does that go? Does that work for emotional eating too? People who are eating because they're happy or sad? Well, so I was gonna say that because like if people, I'm glad you brought up the emotional part because if people are depressed or they're going through anxiety or different situations in their lives and they're reaching for that bag of chips or that box of ice cream or that pint of ice cream and to them that would be intuitive, but it's an emotional response. So how do they separate the two or is it okay just in that moment? Oh, such a brilliant question. So generally when there is a disordered relationship with food, whether that's emotional eating or stress, stressful eating or stress eating or mind, uh, mindless eating or evening binging. So anytime we're having this disordered relationship with food, generally it's really not about the food. The food is just a coping mechanism for what's behind the food. It's, it's actually the behavior. And the goal of that behavior is to fulfill a void. And so when we're looking at emotional eating or mindless eating, I also want to insert that generally 99.9% .9 of the time, there is a layer that is placed on there around dieting, around food restriction, around food control, and around, of course, changing the way that we look because we're flawed. So as an example, let's say a person has had a traumatic event in their life. So we talk about traumas either being sexual or emotional or physical. But other traumas, other forms of traumas are also um, originating from food scarcity. 
So food scarcity, people actually growing up without food, going, going to bed hungry, for example, um, or imposing diets at such a young age, that's also a form of food scarcity. And so all of that becomes very traumatic for the body. And when the body feels trauma or feels unsafe, it immediately kicks in the nervous system that is responsible for survival. This is the sympathetic nervous system. And I coined that protection mode because a lot happens other than just what happens in the physiological body. So what we see when we are in fight or flight or sympathetic nervous state, again, protection mode, is that first and foremost, the body's metabolism slows down. There's more cravings for sugar. There's more cravings for foods that offer immediate reward. So immediate dopamine. And so what we talk about when there is, let's say, emotional eating involved is that we want to identify what the lack is. There is something that is missing. There is something that we are trying to fulfill through food. And food, by the way, is just a vehicle. It could also be drugs. It could be shopping. It could be gambling. It could be sex. But food is just the vehicle in that moment to allow to numb or to actually disconnect from the body when we're feeling certain emotions. And so that's actually a lack of a coping mechanism. But what's super interesting is that when a person has been struggling with emotional eating for a very long time, again, they're very much trying to control or to improve this behavior by controlling the food. And by controlling the food, and then noticing that they're failing because of course every time an emotion comes up and they're needing to turn towards food that just ends up driving them back into the cycle so now they're feeling bad about themselves they're very ashamed they're back into that cycle and then they get trapped in there and so the first step there again is to stop the dieting stop stop the restricting and again to neutralize the food that way we're not actually focusing on the weight we're not focusing on the food we're not focusing on changing our body but what we're addressing instead is the unwanted eating behavior and more specifically what is behind the unwanted eating behavior how is that triggering the nervous system into protection mode which is leading us towards the food wow okay so if somebody gets a phone call which is normally a triggering phone call for them they hang up the phone call and their normal response is to go into the cupboard for the cookies or the chips or the freezer for the ice cream, what have you. And they're still working on giving up all these things, giving up the food rules, listening to their, to their intuition. What is their next step? Do they just follow that pattern and wait for things to happen naturally? Or do they put a pat on the wall and start like get their energy out another way what's what's that step for them so that they're not continuously falling into that same pattern at the same time oh brilliant you guys that's a really great question so you're absolutely right so what we want to do during that situation is actually become the observer of what's going on so when we are in that cycle okay it almost feels like something is taking control over our body over our mind and generally what we think happens is we go from trigger to end of binge. And I'm going to keep referring it to as, as binge, even though when we first learned binge back in elementary school, it was very much associated with binge and purge. And so we have this image of binge being eating a large amount of food in one time and then purging either through exercise or through induced vomiting. However, what we actually want to do is take a non-judgmental stance because here's what happens. Okay. And again, what, why we get trapped back into the cycle. So let's say I'm an emotional eater and I've been struggling with emotional eating for a long time. It is a learned behavior, meaning my thoughts, my emotions, and my actions are all programmed in my mind subconsciously. I'm just going through this program. I get that phone call. I get triggered. I go to the pantry. I'm now eating all these things. Once I'm done, I now feel shame. I now feel self, self-loathing. I am self-judging. And of course, now the negative self-talk comes up. What's wrong with you? Why do you keep doing this? You're out of control. You're so, I can't say the F word, okay? I'll say the other F word, but this F-A-T word, I have a really hard time saying it. But those are the words that we use to describe ourselves. We're the F word, we're ugly, we're gross, we're disgusting. And so if I were to, let's say, bump into one of you both on the street and then start calling you these names, what would your reaction be if I started you know, making fun of your body and the way that you look and Probably call the cops, <laughs> right? Call the cops. Yeah. right. Or, or what would you feel like doing? Like, let's say as I'm, as I'm going off and I'm, I'm saying all this to you. Right. It, it would be very triggering and it's hurtful. It's shameful. I want to cry. I wonder what's wrong with hide. you. What's wrong with you? Not what's wrong with me so much too. Yeah. Right. 
And so you're not realizing it, but you're actually, your body's getting ready to fight, right? To flee, right? Or to freeze. That, that is sympathetic nervous state. So if I were to call you a bunch of names, if I were to pick a fight with you, if I would suddenly start harassing you and abusing you verbally, because that's actually what it is, you would be ready to fight. You're like, hey, wait a minute, right? Yet we're doing this to ourselves. That negative self-talk actually puts us into protection mode. And again, as we said, in protection mode, the trigger causes us to move towards food to cope. And so the first step to break the cycle is to stop dieting, to stop restricting. And then the second thing is to stop judging. It's just to start observing it because there, there's something happening here. I got this phone call. It triggered me to feel a certain way. Why do I feel that way? What is the meaning that I've given here? And most often the meaning exposes a lack that I have, that I'm not enough in some way, that I'm not good enough, that I didn't do something well enough, that I need to do something more of. And so it's a scarcity mindset driven behavior. And so when we allow ourselves to get curious with a non-judgmental stance and just try to see ourselves almost from the third person perspective, I see myself getting off the phone. I see myself moving towards the pantry. And now can I identify the thoughts that are coming up? What are the thoughts going on? Because however we actually behave around food very much exposes our belief systems around life. So if I have this tendency that I need to finish my plate, right? I've got four or five bites left. I cannot waste it. I need to finish my plate. What is that saying about my belief systems? Well, I'm likely living in a scarcity. I feel like there's not going to be enough food. Or we might hear people even saying, don't throw away food. They're starving kids in Africa. You have to eat that. Well, how is eating this food right now helping the starving kids in Africa, right? That those two actually don't align. And so the more that we look at this and, and we understand that the behavior is scarcity driven, what can we do now to fill that void or that lack? Because if right now I have that diet mindset, which is a scarcity mindset, that on Monday my diet starts, and here I am having a dessert, which is not allowed on my diet, I better hurry up and finish it. Well, since I'm already here, I may as well keep going because on Monday my diet starts again. That's a scarcity mindset. That's something is lacking. On Monday, there's gonna be a void, there's gonna be a lack. And so by allowing ourselves to be non-judgmental, we can start to see what is actually going on because it's all a program, right? And it oftentimes stems from our childhood where we were first given our belief systems, where we first learned about who we are in life and started assigning meanings to all the experiences that we had in life, whether they were our own or whether they were given to us by other people, maybe even our parents. And so we live our life from that perspective of a child that was maybe vulnerable, maybe didn't have agency over their own decisions or their actions or their behaviors. And we're still operating with that mindset, with that belief system, still in adulthood. And so there's a lot to unpack here. But essentially, the only way that we can do that is through non-judgment and just a sense of curiosity and understand that it's not about the food. It's not about the diet. It's not about my weight. It's really about what's driving the unwanted eating behavior. Sure. I think this is a great conversation. There's a lot of information that you're sharing that our audience is going to love listening to, and I'm sure they're learning a lot. But if they want to learn more, where can they reach out and contact you? Where could they find out more information about you or what you're doing? So first and foremost, uh, to get in touch with me directly, you can go to Instagram at Sherry Siobhan Fitness is my handle. You'll be able to communicate with me there. But then I also do have a download. It's a free download on makepeacewithfood.com that gives you seven strategies to overcome any unwanted eating behavior. And it's really simplified. There's a beautiful journal there too and a place to do some self-reflection. Amazing. Okay. We're going to link to that in our show notes at planttrainers.com. Sherry, thank you so much for being with us on the Plant Trainers Podcast. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to be here today. I'm so honored. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's Make Peace with Food Minisode on the Fall in Love with Fitness Podcast. If this has resonated with you today, I want to invite you to subscribe to the show so you never miss a beat. And if you know someone who could benefit from this conversation, then please share this episode with them. Let's work together to help as many people as possible make peace with food and fall in love with fitness. And by the way, I need to mention that if you rate and review this podcast on iTunes and send over the screenshot to Sherry at SherryShaban.com, 
you'll receive a $500 voucher to join me at one of my upcoming retreats or to use it in our Make Peace with Food coaching program. And don't forget to visit MyFoodFreedomLifestyle.com to join the free Facebook group for more resources. And remember, athlete, you are an inspiration. I cannot wait to hear your story.